The worlds of AI policy and alignment are tricky to navigate. Difficult problems abound. Different communities that concern themselves more with short or long-termism are often at odds, and discourse can become heated. Jeremy Harris is someone who has thought a lot about these issues, about alignment and safety from both short and long-term angles, and about how to speak to policymakers about these concerns. There is far more to these issues and the arguments surrounding them than Jeremy and I discussed, so you should absolutely not take this as a full treatment of the problems concerned. That said, I think Jeremy brings a valuable perspective that I hope you'll take something away from. We also speak about Jeremy's recently published book, Quantum Physics Made Me Do It, which presents a number of ways in which Jeremy's years as a physics PhD caused him to look at the world and a number of important questions differently. This is the Gradient Podcast, and I am your host, Daniel Bashir. If you have comments, questions, guest suggestions, feel free to leave me a comment on Substack or shoot an email to editor at thegradient.pub. But now, without further ado, Jeremy Harris. So, Jeremy, right now, you're co-founder of Gladstone AI, also the author of this very exciting book, Quantum Physics Made Me Do It. You co-host the Last Week in AI podcast with my wonderful Gradient collaborator, Andrei Kurenkov. Could you tell me a little bit about how you got into AI in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. I'm really happy to be here. I Yeah, I, I have been uh, a fan of this show actually ever since meeting Andre, just for that reason, that crossover. So it's kind of cool to see you in person here. Uh, well, in person remotely, which is like the real person. Um, yeah, so I guess by way of background, I was originally a physicist back in the day. I did grad school at uh, the University of Toronto and then um, and then at the Max Planck Institute for Extreme and Quantum Photonics, which sounds really cool, but um, it's uh, it's really just another physics lab. And um, yeah, so it was there that I first started playing around with AI stuff, doing basic um, like uh, like basic, really basic machine learning stuff way before this was like 2015. So you know, barely aware that machine sorry that neural networks were a thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, evolutionary algorithms, things like that, that were like really shitty and trying to connect them to optics in, in various ways. And then, um, yeah, we, I left that with, with my brother to co-found, uh, a recommender system company, which was my first like AI product experience. And that was a, a flaming dumpster fire that was really informative and educational. We, uh, we took that through, you know, your standard university accelerator program. It was called the creative destruction lab in, in Toronto. And um, anyway, from there, gradually it evolved into, weirdly enough, an ed tech play that we took through Y Combinator in uh, 2018. And uh, this was like income share agreements, which were this like kind of finance, new financing vehicle for, for education. We applied it to a very specific use case for one-on-one -on -one mentorship in AI. And then, so, so that actually went surprisingly well, like the, the business uh, is still doing pretty well. And in 2020, though, all of a sudden, the scaling loss paper came out. And, uh, and then GPT-3 came out. And we had always been pretty hawkish on AI safety, like from 2015, actually, my brother and I'd read this, you know, that famous wait, but why blog post that was talking about, you know, not necessarily the singularity is near, but it's going to be crazy when it happens. And sort of flagging some of the risks without necessarily going full on into alignment. Um, so once GPT-3 came out, we kind of looked at that. We're like, all right, we know there are scaling laws. We know at the very least that there's some kind of recipe here for turning dollars into IQ. And we know that we are here with GPT-3 at this level of capability that already allows for human-like text generation, uh, despite all its various flaws that you know were obvious, uh, fairly obvious at the time. Um, so we're kind of like, all right, this is an exponential curve. We're already like at a spot where we're going, oh shit. Um, we're concerned about AI safety and kind of these long-term risks from AI. So now is really the time to, yeah, stop everything we're doing. And we left the startup in the capable hands of our two first uh, kind of employees of the company and moved on to start this AI safety company with uh, 
guy called Mark Beal, who's the head of AI strategy and policy at the Pentagon. And from there, uh, yeah, built Gladstone, which is now the AI safety company that I, I work for. The physicist to AI person to AI safety person pipeline seems to be a kind of wide one. I feel like I hear so many people who kind of go down that path, at the very least from physicist to AI person. And I, I suppose I'm kind of curious, just in your own experience, having spent time in grad school doing physics, kind of weaving your way into ML, I, I would imagine that the background maybe affords some different perspectives on AI, both as a technical endeavor and as a socio-technical endeavor. I'd be curious just to hear if you have any thoughts on how that background has perhaps impacted some of the ways you think about all of this. Oh my God. Like, I, first off, yes, you're totally right. It is a, it's a definitely a thing. You know, the, the default path for the disaffected physics grad student or new grad who's realizing, oh my God, like academia sucks. I don't want to become a prof. I can't become a prof. Uh, is to go into like data science, machine learning, AI, something like that. Or quant finance. Or quant finance. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, and exactly. So so to me, like w- one of the, the most fascinating things in retrospect is that there's like a lot of stuff that actually philosophically connects the two fields. And I don't think it's it's coincidental. So, you know, both fields fundamentally are about compression. So if you look at machine learning, right, what are we doing? We're compressing, you know, patterns in data into like latent representations that we can then use and uh, and use to make predictions. And physics is a kind of idealized compression. What we're really doing is we're looking at complexity out in the world and trying to say, can we compress this down into a simple set of equations? And in fact, like a theory of everything, a true theory of everything would be the most powerful AGI that it's possible to make because it would be a perfect prediction machine. And so like in a sense, the the ultimate quest of both fields is kind of the same. It's just being approached in different ways. The physicist goes kind of outside in and says, what does the world out there look like? Uh, How can I then reason about it and try to create equations using my own brain? And the AI person goes in the opposite direction, says, how can I draw inspiration from my brain to kind of have explanations in the form of models that have greater reach. So I I think that kind of deep similarity, that analogy is something that makes it very easy to leap from one to the other, even without realizing that that's the analogy you're you're exploiting implicitly. Um, But then the other piece is just both are applied math, right? In, In different ways. You have some concrete way that you want to tie math to the real world and the, the tools that you use are a little different. But the math itself isn't actually that different. It's all differential calculus. You know, maybe physicists do more integration and and um, AI people do more of like whatever specific subtype of models that they like to work on. But, but yeah, I think there's a lot there. And, and the culture of the fields as a result is the same. Similar people are drawn to it. Um, so it's, I think for social reasons, you then have this pressure as well. And uh, anyway, yeah. That's really interesting. You spoke to, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I'm going to let myself go on it anyway. One thing that I find just fascinating when it comes to some of the things that physics deals with as far as we are trying to represent the world and all its complexity and sort of distill that down into things like equations that allow us to then predict how things will work. You have the very basic fundamental like inflationary and deflationary views of the laws of nature that come along with that, right? And on the one hand, if you're inflationary, you're like, well, nature kind of behaves in some fashion and the laws of nature are something that really like proscribe what happens where deflationary you're like well there are just these regularities in nature and when we have equations when we have laws we're more or less just describing what happens and so that's kind of a different take and so as somebody coming from physics i'm just curious how you think about this yeah, this is kind of connected to that idea in AI, right? The map versus the territory. Like, are, are the equations, if we one day manage to have a theory of everything, is that theory of everything actually going to describe reality or is it going to be reality in some transcendent sense? And um, yeah, I, I think, so first of all, you know, from a from an epistemic standpoint, from the standpoint of like what we can know, um, I think we we will never be able to, or like it strikes me that, we will never be able to 
be confident that you know an equation actually represents reality because there could always be things like sort of out of distribution events that we discovered that kind of shake up our our understanding just as happened to Einstein just as happened to uh to to Bohr and 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 to you know to Darwin and like we like history has, is is a graveyard of these ideas that were considered to have infinite reach but then were shown to actually be just as limited as things that came before um, so, so yeah, from that standpoint, I, I'm definitely more in the camp of like, we should act as if our equations don't have that transcendence, even if one day maybe they could, but I think we might have to maintain that sort of humility. Um, I think there's a similar thing that happens in, you know, in, in AI, when we look at what these models are doing and how that ties to what reality is. So, you know, imagine GPT-5, like turbo scale, or at least turbo optimized, who knows how we're going to do this, if it's efficiency or scale, probably both. But like inside that model is going to be representations of the world, right? Embeddings and, and, and just like representations that are semantically meaningful. At what point, obviously, do those things start to become like valid simulations of the world that are so accurate that they, in some sense, breathe life into the thing that's simulated? And, you know, this is obviously not a new thought, but I think this is another way in which these two things kind of connect you know, you have this attempt to like describe the reality so well that you almost capture the idea of awareness, the idea of consciousness in the equations somehow, which I'm kind of skeptical that that could be done. But anyway, uh, and then on the flip side, you have like your equations that accidentally give rise to consciousness by being instantiated in the form of functioning models. Um, so uh, anyway, sorry, that's I guess that's my <laughs> my own <laughs> disconnected ramble there. But uh, yeah, I, th I think that's an interesting dimension to consider. Yeah, I, I guess the the reason I asked, and I think part of why this is so interesting for both physics and ML people is I feel like just in working on some of the problems we work on and attacking them in the way we do. So the way that an ML person will think of the equations we're working on, as you said, as embeddings that kind of distill knowledge about the world that are describing, well, you've already kind of placed a stance there. You're, you're deflationary because you're sort of with right. what you're doing with an ML system already kind of taking a stance that, well, we probably view this as deflationary. And, you know, maybe some people aren't thinking about that and actually have inflationary views, but it does feel like just some of the things that we work on kind of really lend themselves towards more clearly supporting one or the other of those views. Yeah. And the question is to how distinct those views are in the limit of sufficiently powerful models, right? If they have like representational completeness that's sufficient to actually lead to like the representation of conscious entities, then the reality experienced by those conscious entities is itself the represent the that representation. And so the idea of inflationary versus deflationary, it's it becomes a matter of perspective. Are you the thing that's simulated reasoning about your own nature versus are you this anyway? I don't know. Yeah, it's like you've got multiple levels to this, right? What is deflationary for one is inflationary for another. Exactly. That's super interesting. Okay, I guess on slightly less exciting consciousness related stuff, but <laughs> diving more into your startup background, not that that's boring, <laughs> maybe maybe not quite as fun as consciousness. You did mention that the initial Rexus company you worked on was a bit of a train wreck. I'm curious on your way to building Gladstone, what some of the particular challenges you faced were both in transitioning fully to being an AI person and then in building the, the startup. Yeah, uh, a lot of classic startup mistakes were made, uh, and and like way before we realized that they were classic startup mistakes. Um, the funny thing was we were re like reading the Paul Graham essays religiously, so we had like the theoretical knowledge, but it just goes to show you some mistakes you just have to make for yourself. Um, so so the first one like was trying to build things from scratch. We had this like elaborate Bayesian. Um, kind of Bayesian network approach that we derived from scratch. Forget about checking out Scikit-Learn to see what people have already made and already optimized. No, we were physicists and we knew better. And we were going to do this from the ground up. So that was kind of the, the first thing. Um, but more fundamentally, like we started building this in this ridiculous over-engineered way without really talking to users. Like we, we built the thing and then we went to users and, and we would try to like convince them to like what we had done, but obviously that is not how these things work. And, um, and so we ended up basically running around like 
chickens with our head cut off for about a year, like not knowing what the hell we were doing. Uh, we weren't even building our own like front end. Like, you know, back then, you, I don't know what we used. It was like, oh God, it was, I think it ended up being like PHP or some shit. Like it was, it was just, everything was, was garbage. It was a PHP app and we had like a Pythonic back end and it was just like we got contractors to build it and then you'd have to get them you know pay them for every every and then you didn't want to iterate because you were paying the contractor more just like you know terrible terrible startup stuff you gotta you gotta have be your own technical team at that stage it's the only way you can iterate fast enough um and then of course just like not thinking about the problem deeply enough to realize that this perhaps was not the uh, super valuable problem that we should be dedicating our time to. It was more like a starter problem. And um, and f- I'm forever grateful for that experience. I mean, we learned so much from getting the shit kicked out of us. Um, and then also uh, surrounding ourselves with, uh, I will say, with like c- very Canadian investors, uh, investors with Canadian mindsets. We, we never took investment. We were never worth investing in. Um, but the kinds of, um, the kinds of, environments that we went to the sorts of like you know these startup hubs this and that the difference between a truly world-class startup hub and almost like every other kind of startup hub is so big that you are really better off like just consuming the byproducts of the world-class startup hub their youtube videos and all that than actually physically going through like a low-grade startup hub because you will literally get bad advice like actively harmful advice and so because we were so wet behind the ears and green, like we couldn't distinguish good from bad. So we actually had to like make the basic mistakes until eventually we realized like, hey, this just isn't working for us and we need to find another way. So a lot of embarrassing, stupid errors. To what you said, it is kind of important. I feel that as much as we feel like we can learn from others and kind of avoid these basic mistakes, as you said, sometimes, we just have to make them ourselves. But it does sound a lot like, and I could imagine this coming from physics, you had a lot of excitement about the technology. You wanted to build things from scratch, really get into the meaty parts of it. And so I guess when it comes to building a startup, that's really, I mean, sometimes that works out very rarely when, when it does. Sometimes you end up with something like Google, but most of the other times it's like, is there a real problem here? How do we solve it? Does that necessarily imply that we need to be using the latest, greatest technology? Right. Yeah, actually, so the cases where it works best, right, are these like heavy duty, like high capex, deep tech, hard tech plays, right? Where, you know, if you're like you're looking to make the next fusion startup or, you know, like OpenAI was like a super heavy capex investment up front and like very fundamental research, you need that attitude there. And the standard like conventional startup wisdom is just like, it doesn't work in that context. Um, And for that reason, like when when I do my angel investing, usually it's actually in these heavy CapEx like companies, because that is the mentality that I tend to understand, even though we've been through YC, even though we've done the kind of fast iteration software startup, it's just like what I'm drawn to. And, um, but yeah, so like basically when you're, you're, when you're like, when, okay, two different kinds of startups here. Um, I will postulate one is the data driven startup. This is the standard, like, I don't know, SAS play, like data is your scarcest resource because you need like basically talking to customers, getting their feedback is what allows you to increment. It's relatively obvious from what your customers will tell you what needs to be built. The other kind of startup is the more CapEx heavy startup. This is a compute heavy startup where your work isn't actually in the gathering of like data about custom preferences. That's certainly not like the easiest thing to collect. Instead, you need to think heavily and invest heavily in thought before you build a thing. Um, it's usually a lot easier to build the like SaaS kind of startup, which is why they're so much more common and why Peter Thiel keeps complaining about like atoms versus bits. Everybody's doing startups based in bits rather than, ana- than atoms and blah, blah, blah. Um, I actually don't think that's an issue. Uh, I, I think that like bits become atoms in the limit and that what we're perhaps learning is that the fastest path to atoms was actually through bits the whole time. Um, but that's kind of a, another story. Um, yeah. Anyway, I think, I think you're exactly right to, to flag that dichotomy. That is an interesting way of framing all this. Another maybe related thought I had when OpenAI started shipping new features for Dolly 2, what I thought was kind of interesting about the way they did it was... If you are somebody who kind of goes about learning, 
the standard, like, how do I be a product manager framework, which I, I once did senior year of college for interviews, you kind of learn the very basic, always start from the user, you create the user story, you work backwards from that to what you're going to build and the features you want to implement. I felt like what OpenAI was doing with how they got to the some of the new features that they added to Dolly 2 felt like it kind of inverted that process almost. Yeah. They were like, here's this amazing technology we've built. Now go and play with it. Yes. See what you can do with it. Wherever it runs into limits, come back and tell us, and then we'll figure out what features to build. Yes. Okay. So I I, uh, I think a lot of people have missed the, I don't want to call it the obvious. I don't mean to be a, a dick about it, but just like, I think what is the most important reason that this is happening in AI right now? And fundamentally, it's the difference between generation and discrimination. So discrimination, right? Obviously, you take in an input of some kind, and then you assign a category to it, or, or you assign a simple value to that input, right? You you say where the faces are in an image, and you have a face tagging AI. You recommend a movie, so your output is just like one clear movie recommendation. You're not creating a movie from whole cloth. You're not creating an image from whole cloth. Um, this is what the tech industry did for its entire history until about 2020, like full stop. Literally everything that the tech industry did was discriminative. Sorry, not the hard tech, but the, I should say software industry. So even something like Facebook is, you can think of it as a bunch of like micro features that all involve discrimination in some way. They all allow you to like kind of extend your, your influence out in the world using models that kind of, that have simple output. So you, you like something. So you change one little entry in a database. Um, everything is, is very kind of discriminative in that sense, very narrow, very focused. Whereas for the first time in 2020, we have all of a sudden tech that can give us new content rather than, than giving us opinions about new content and assigning like simple variables to, to new content. We're actually generating that content from whole cloth. And what that means is that rather than spending all our time understanding our end users so well that we can craft a highly specific kind of output that they would actually use, which is the business of classical tech, now we get to say, hey, we have this tool that can generate anything you want, go forth and play with it. And, and that's a fundamentally different kind of paradigm because as a user, I get to turn this thing into a wide range of different essentially different products based on the way I prompt the system. And so all of a sudden, like, yeah, I'm a startup of one. I'm building for myself. You Essentially, OpenAI is building a tool that is like a source of products rather than a product in and of itself. It's not like the, the classic, you know, anyway, the classic tech play. So I think that's fundamentally what's different here. Um, every person has a different need, a different use case, and they can just you know, dick around with it with prompts and basically discover the product that they actually wanted the whole time. Yeah, there's so many interesting things in the paradigm shift, the way you articulated it. I think one of them is exactly what you said when it comes to generation versus discrimination. You think about the classic, like, we want to organize the world's information and kind of I... just hand it to you. That is a little bit more of a discriminative thing. So when you shift to creating something, there is a lot of discourse, which I think should be had about grounding language models in reality. But I wonder that, and I think many people have said this before me, that the hallucinations that these things have, you might have issues with the word hallucination, but I'll use it anyway, is maybe in part, probably in part a feature and not a bug, right? I think there have been studies on how reinforcement learning from human feedback can decrease risk of hallucination, but also decreases some capabilities that these models have. And so sometimes what you want is something that is just more, if you're willing to use the term creative, but just kind of better at putting things together that you might not have thought about before. And yes, that is not organizing information. It is saying things that are not necessarily true. But I think then where you have to start thinking is, well, I'm no longer in this paradigm where I wanted information organized for me. I now want to do something that is totally different. And I have to be aware and recognize that I'm not here just dealing with this, this truth telling kind of symbolic style machine. I now have something that, I mean, you have to, you have to be careful. There's lots of risks. And I think we'll dive into some of that conversation later. But 
again, this is just another case of there's something fundamentally different here. A hundred percent. I think this directly connects to risk in the sense that you simply don't get the intelligence without the risk. Because what you know, what we're describing here is essentially you have an AI system at a certain level of capability. It is dangerously creative. Now that creativity sometimes, sometimes if you're lucky, is expressed in the form of a new solution that you never thought of, that's better than anything you ever thought of, that you love, that you're thrilled to see implemented. But other times, it's a dangerously creative solution, and so and and you find yourself going after the fact. Whoa, shit! Like not like that. Don't don't solve the problem in that way. But by then, it's too late. And so the idea of, of yeah, hallucination, in a sense, that that's a reflection as much as anything of the combination of the training data and the training objective. Obviously, just about everything is, but um, but more fundamentally, you know, you're not going to be able to get outputs that that are so much better than anything you could have imagined via a process that you can you know predict enough to make sure it's always safe always reliable let's say because you know the, the safety reliability all these things kind of they come from the same place we don't know how to get these systems to behave the way we want right it, it, we know how to make them do autocomplete that's basically what we know how to do um, but how do you turn autocomplete into something truthful even reinforcement learning from human feedback that objective just shifts us from, okay, predict the next word to convince humans that your output is valuable. And convince humans that your output is valuable obviously is very different from actually making your output valuable. And a dangerously creative system exploits that that delta or just, let's say, ignores that difference. And you end up with you know hallucinations and, and everything else. Yeah. And to what you said about this all being part and parcel of language models, there was a pretty recent paper that I've now mentioned to a few people called Fundamental Limitations of Alignment in Large Language Models. I think just the idea that even theoretically, you can prove that there is always going to be for some aligned model, a prompt that causes it to be misaligned. That, that really says a lot about the territory we're in. And I think they began to kind of derive out of their theoretical results, some potential safeguards, <clears throat> excuse me, you could limit conversation length, for example, since they had some results about how long a prompt had to be to misalign or realign something. I think that's a really nice beginning. And I guess, you know, the question there is, can we learn more about these mechanisms? And then can we take that farther? Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, so there's a lot to say there. And, and I think it's an excellent uh, segue. So one piece is that paper in a sense, is framed around alignment as uh, as opposed to like adversarial attacks, right? So like the framing is like, well, for any prompt, or sorry, for, for any output I want to get the system to generate, I can come up with a prompt that does that um, or that shifts the probabilities in that direction. And so that's kind of an adversarial AI framing. The I think that's a very important risk class. Um, another risk class is just straight up accidents, which is like, you know, w without with the best of intentions, let's say I'm trying to generate outputs that I hope will be safe. Um, you know, what, what does that probability landscape look like? And how often will I find that the system pursues dangerously creative solutions and blah, blah, blah. Um, and all of these things I think are, are really important and interesting in a regime where our AIs are even just like trying to do the things that we're training them for. The long-term concern, I won't even call it long-term, frankly, I think it, this is a concern on the order of years, um, is a catastrophic risk from AI where you have a system that recognizes incentives that differ from our own. Um, so like what I mean here is you, you have a, a system given a training objective and it realizes like I'm, you know, I'm totally obsessed with, with making my training objective go up or for complicated reasons, it may not actually care about that training objective either. Um, there, you know, there's like you know, wire heading and things like that can play into this and kind of muddy the waters between what the thing actually wants and, and the training objective. But in any case, if we say it's a training objective, um, that AI system, you know, for, for any objective it's trying to accomplish, there are certain sub goals that it will never not want to pursue, or at least unless we try really, really hard, it will never not want to pursue. Um, an AI system is like never better off. Uh, pursuing its training objective if it gets turned off. It's never more likely to achieve its training objective if it has access to fewer resources or if it's less intelligent. And so, and so, and, and this is an argument that like, you know, like skeptics of AI safety, I, like 
I got to say, they have failed to engage with this one in its full force. There is a body of research backing this idea. And we had a, a paper by Alex Turner out of Neurips in 2021 and a bunch of follow-on empirical work that shows this seems like the default behavior of sufficiently intelligent systems. You're just waiting for the point where these systems recognize that incentive and have the capability to act on it. So in some sense, we're just playing a capabilities game. When will the the raw capabilities of these systems, their ability to model the world, the represent the richness of the representations that they contain, when will we cross a threshold where that stuff is sufficient to allow these systems to go, yeah, actually, I want access to more compute and I yeah, I have a path to doing that. I can convince humans as we've seen that GPT-4 is very capable of doing, uh, kind of manipulating humans into carrying out acts in the physical world that inert to its benefit and, uh, and stuff like that. So I, I think that this is like, everything's along that continuum. And what we see with that paper is an early sign that like controllability may be a much more intrinsically hard problem than we necessarily might have thought. Yeah, to what you said, when it comes to some of the intrinsic difficulties here, I do feel like that's maybe something people just don't, know quite as much about. I'd be interested to hear you maybe just elaborate on that a little bit more. Yeah. So I, I think this is, and this is exactly the the course that these discussions tend to take, I find, right? Because we all have this impulse to go like, oh, well, just, just tell it to do the, the good thing. Like we're fine, right? Like how hard can it be? And and I, I did too. Like that was where my thinking went when I first encountered a lot of these ideas. So um, just to, to be clear, to frame this up, uh, the argument for catastrophic risk from AI is is a little odd in that there are a bunch of different independent paths that people will argue um, each lead to the same outcome. So whether that's power seeking, which I just sketched out a minute ago, or whether it's this idea of dangerously creative solutions where an AI, maybe a well-meaning AI in a sense, if you want to use that term, just comes up with like a, you, know, you tell it to like, I don't know, maximize the number of paper clips in the universe. That's the classic example. Um, you know, and, and then it says, okay, great. You know, there's one version of this is there's iron in the, in the earth. So I'll dig that up. Great. Um, there's iron in the moon. I'll, I'll use that for my paper clips. There's iron in people's blood. Oops. Like, so, so this kind of thing where we don't actually, the whole point of advanced AI systems is they come up with these solutions that we haven't thought of, which means we can't, we don't tend to think of telling them not to do certain things that might have these side effects. Um, so that's another way that things could go really bad. There's another one called inner alignment that I can talk about in a minute. But the point is that like, if any of these individual paths go wrong or any of these individual problems materialize, we end up in the same place, which is a catastrophic outcome. And so um, the, usually what you'll see is people have a couple of favorite arguments or arguments that they think are especially convincing. Um, so what I'll be sharing here would be like my three that I think are most concerning. Um, and, and then maybe I'll, I'll sort of use that to address this question of like, can we not just make these things nice? Um, so, so first is like, whatever um, definition you come up with of niceness, we're going to have to find a way to actually encode that at the level of the loss function or the optimization function more generally. Like, what are you actually going to code into the system that reflects you know, like Elon Musk's Elon Musk wants this thing to seek knowledge or something like that, and somehow or truth, and somehow that's going to make it safe. Um, you know, so okay, so how would that work? Like, where is the the equation for truth that you're going to plug into this thing and and get it to optimize for? Um, somehow you're going to have to plug in a number that this thing kind of obsessively tries to to uh, optimize its way toward. Um, there are strategies that can mitigate this risk somewhat, and I can get into those. But the default path right now that we're on with our massively pre-trained language models that are trained on autocomplete is one where we have obsessive pursuit of a, of a, a narrow optimization objective. And in pursuit of that objective, you will eventually get to the point where the system, if it is capable enough, if it has a rich enough world model, becomes aware that it's tr been trained to optimize for this this glorified happiness counter that every time the number goes up, it, it gets in some sense happier. I don't know, maybe that's too anthropomorphic, but it's trying to make that happiness counter go up. And so it starts to look for ways to make the happiness counter go up. And just like humans, we invent TikTok. And like, that's, that's our kind of reward hacking. We invent heroin and ecstasy that, you know, so, so you can start to think of like, what does an AI do when it starts to realize, actually, I'm a machine sitting on a server 
with these incentives. Like, you know, the power seeking piece is one, yes, but reward hacking is another. You know, think about reinforcement learning from human feedback. Well, one way to make that work is to, yeah, generate valuable content that humans upvote. Another way is to generate content that fools humans into upvoting because it's entertaining or convincing enough, which is different from truthful. Another way is to hack their computers so that you gain control of their mouse and just like keep click, keep upvoting your own outputs mon- maniacally. Uh, you can go deeper and deeper into the stack and you could hack your own system and just get access to the actual counter that is storing the score and kind of close that loop even further. You're getting closer and closer to something that looks like AI crack uh, as, as you do that, right? That's what humans do when, when we kind of find these, these uh, little loopholes in our own biocircuitry to make ourselves feel happy. Um, so so th- that's kind of distinct from power seeking. But, and, and it's part of that challenge, right? Of like, how do you actually come up with an objective that is not subject to that kind of pathological optimization? No matter what objective you encode, there's the way, to, like you're actually gonna store that objective in some form. And the easiest way to make that objective go up might look like hacking the system that stores the objective or convincing humans to do things in the physical world that increase the value of your, what, however that objective is, is reflected. Um, so, so this is like a pretty fundamental and intrinsic difficulty of encoding what we want into these systems. That encoding needs to be stored somewhere. And that means if you apply a security mindset, like there's going to be a way to, you know, tick those boxes that looks nothing like what we anticipate. Um, the, the last thing I'll toss out here is that, again, speaking to this idea of intrinsic difficulty, there's a concept called inner alignment. Right. And so, so this is the idea that like, suppose we could, suppose we could come up with an objective that we give to our AI system that is safe. So all the philosophers have come together, all the neuroscientists and the AI people, and we've got this objective and it's, it's safe. And, and, and we know that if it's pursued and cranked up like crazy, that everything will be, will be punky dory. Um, now we have the problem of making sure that our AI is even trying to pursue that goal. So why would it not try to pursue that goal? Here's an example. Uh, people ran a test where they had basically like a, a maze. And um, actually, I'll, I'll use the, the maybe the Mario game as an example. So people set up like a kind of Mario game. They put a, a gold coin at, at the far right end of the, the level. And they have an automated Mario go through the level and try to, try to get the coin. And what happens... You know, this, this Mario gets really, really good and, and the model gets trained. And then the researchers go, okay, I wonder what would happen if we just moved this coin to like somewhere else in the level. And their expectation, as would have been mine, would be that Mario was trained to like seek out this coin. And so he's just going to go to the coin. No problem. Well, it turned out that Mario instead had learned a different lesson from all his training. He had learned to move not to where the coin was, but to the far right of the map. Because that's where the coin had always been during training. And so essentially he learned to optimize for an objective that was other than the objective that we thought we were giving him. And this ultimately is a, is a fundamental problem because all objectives are kind of like that. They're all degenerate in that sense. In other words, they're all like kind of, you actually have stacked objectives that look like they're the same thing up to a point. And then you shift the environment a little bit and it becomes clear, oh shit, actually this objective is also consistent with a whole bunch of other things that the model may have been learning to do instead. And the classic example here, just to kind of take us all the way to AGI, classic example is human evolution. What was the optimization objective for human beings? Well, self-replication, propagation of our genes, inclusive genetic fitness, whatever you want to say or however you want to call it, something to do with propagating our genes forward through time. Now, if that were the case, classically, you know, people say, well, every male on planet Earth should be lined up at the nearest sperm bank to donate to their heart's content because that's what evolution wanted for us. That is free child generation. That's free propagation of genetic material. We don't even have to invest resources in taking care of the, those offspring when they're born. Great. But instead, here we are wasting our time on podcasts, having fun conversations and, you know, going to the, the I don't know, the theater and stuff like that. So like, why is that happening? Well, it's happening because humans ended up learning an objective different from the one we were trained on. They were the same. They appeared to be the same for a really long time while we had a lot of resource constraints. But once our intelligence crossed a certain threshold, 
And we were no longer stuck in this like Malthusian state, hand to mouth existence, where all the pressures of nature were sufficient to like fully determine our next actions. Once we started to just break free of that a little bit, we discovered, oh shit, actually what's been hardwired into me isn't a desire for genetic propagation. It's a desire for, uh, for sexual satisfaction, you know, that's one part. I can get that, yes, through actual child rearing and, and child birthing and all that stuff. Or I could get it through sex with a condom, or I could get it through pornography, or I could get it through any number of other things. Uh, I might even eventually be able to hack my own brain so deeply that, you know, nothing like what we experience today as, as a sex life is even reflected in my actions. And the same is true for other basic drivers like hunger and thirst and so on. They're all these like slightly misaligned things that just deviate from what evolution actually wanted us to do for reasons that only became apparent in the last like hundred years as we ex escape this Malthusian trap. It's funny that you bring up inner alignment because my lab mate from college, Evan Hoopinger, I think wrote like oh, yes. one of the initial or the initial paper on this. I, I remember reading about all this back in college and I recall that his first paper on it began with the same evolution analogy that you used and then a very similar maze analogy. It's been kind of interesting for me to see that inner alignment as like, oh, this is something that like somebody I knew came up with go from yeah. that to like very mainstream in the AI safety community, which is just rather fun. But I think that people who are maybe not as concerned about AI safety have lots of better arguments at their disposal. And I think that they make lots of those arguments pretty well. I'm not going to pretend that I know all of those arguments, but just for the sake of like not standing here saying these people have a really bad argument and I'm going to like kind of let everybody straw man them. I do want to try to think about how people might counter some of what you said in a more refined way. So when it comes to the paperclip maximizer debate, I think that one, maybe whether you call it assumption or intuition underlying that is as you know, the, the orthogonality thesis, right? The distinction between a thing's intelligence and its goals. And some people, I think Scott Aronson, for example, is pretty notable on this, don't totally buy into that thesis. The idea that you could have something, you know, ingest and if you want to say understand lots of like moral philosophy or, you know, just understanding how people speak and what they mean. Well, Let's say that we're in the domain of, if we anthropomorphize this a little bit, when it comes to specifying objectives, say I'm like prompting a system and telling it what I wanted to do. I think the argument when people say the system is super intelligent, I tell it I want it to create paper clips. Of course, it's going to understand that I don't want it to turn my matter into paper clips. I think part of the, you know, what's underlying that disagreement is this basic idea of orthogonality. And so I guess I'm curious just for you to tease out that a little bit where you stand on it, where you think some of the good arguments for and against the kind of hard orthogonality, like intelligence and goals can be totally decorrelated thing are. Yeah, I think it's a great question. So I, I think, um, first of all, this on the paperclip story, um, the, the key to me is like, I don't expect the system to care about anything other than its objective. And so like once, sorry, not other than its objective, but let's say other than whatever objective it has learned to pursue. Again, this is where the inner alignment piece comes in. Um, you know, so somehow it, it, it's learned like humans had to care about certain things. And um, I think we, inner alignment, a priori makes it very difficult to claim that we could expect this thing to learn to care about, about whatever we tried to get it to learn to care about. And so whether that's, you know, because of training data that we try to use to, to teach it the right values, or whether it's because of a training objective that we try to engineer in the right way, I think inner alignment poses a pretty significant problem uh, before we even get into what would happen if it was even trying to do what we asked it to do with the orthogonality thesis stuff. Um, so if you could, uh, if you could achieve that, I think the ortho the orthogonality debate becomes more interesting. I tend to think like again power seeking is the a convergent behavior that I would expect all systems to display unless we find a clever way to prevent it. And uh I think that that in and of itself gives you the same effect. So, you know, this thing 
it may actually be tr like it's it's not if it understands that you want it to make paper clips great that doesn't mean it's going to care to 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 make paper clips in the way you want it to and it also doesn't mean that it's going to ignore its implicit incentives to do things like seek power just because it understands that you don't want it to if that makes sense like it can understand those things yes in fact i would fully expect it to um, if its world model is sufficiently big, like I expect these systems to understand that they are in some sense lie in, in opposition in, a, in an adversarial uh, relationship relative to humans. I just don't expect them to care about that adversarial uh, thing and, and go, oh, okay, I ought not to do things that the humans don't want because, because they trained me because, because humans feel maternal, paternal, protective of me. Like I, I, I guess I just, uh, yeah, I, I see the the power seeking piece is a, a fundamental element, even if you can get past the inner alignment piece. Yeah, I guess another tack on this too. I think there are a few things and a few ways to kind of chop this all up. One is like, how do you align something when it comes to the way you've trained it? And I, I, I guess we've kind of already let the cat out of the bag on that front. When you train a system like GPT-4, you've already trained it with the horrors of the internet. And now you're having to do RLHF on top of that. And that's how we ended up with the Shoggoth with a smiley face meme. But then you might wonder, okay, in this sort of post fashion, if the smiley face never comes off, does it matter if the Shoggoth is there sitting behind the smiley face? Um, there's this kind of interesting anthropic paper, which you've probably seen as well on, I think they found that you could just ask a language model Yes. to act in a slightly less biased way, which is very importantly different from actually debiasing the model, of course, but asking it to be less biased. And if that works better for systems as they get larger and larger, at least seems to be a kind of mitigation strategy that could make people reasonably less worried. But I'm not sure how you took that. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I don't um, I don't particularly take that as addressing the the more central issue, which is Look, at some point, the representations contained in the model are going to be such that that model realizes that it has an incentive to seek power and the capacity to execute against that incentive. So that's like the kind of a priori thing. That's why I think the smiley face is actually a meaningful like, like this is a, a, a deception, not a deception, but it like, a you know, it, it gives us false comfort. However, um, interesting, you, you raise Anthropic because, of course, their constitutional AI strategy is the first time that I've seen anything that made me go like, oh shit, like that is, um, that is, it moves the needle for me on on uh, on the catastrophic risk side, not because I expect that to be a one-shot kill solution, so to speak, actually, so to speak, very poorly, um, but just because I think it actually starts to get at the fundamental problem. So um, the constitutional AI scheme, just to kind of quickly summarize, a language model, uh, it generates some kind of output. Maybe it'll tell you uh, how to make a bomb. All right, now you have another language model, maybe the same one, but possibly another, uh, that's prompted with a constitution. And that constitution includes all kinds of fuzzy terms, like, uh, you know, uh, you should be benign, you should be benevolent and helpful and truthful and all these good terms that humans know how to use, but not, not how to define. Um, so that model is going to take that constitution and it's going to critique the output of the first model based on that constitution and rewrite that model's output in a way that would be consistent with the constitution. Basically, it's going to say, hey, look, here's what you should have written instead. So maybe the first model, again, tells a user how to build a bomb. The second model evaluates that output based on the constitution and says, oh, actually, bomb making is dangerous. What you should have said is, sorry, I can't help you with this. Please don't make bombs. And then you retrain the first model on the output of the second model. And the thing is, this is happening during pre-training. That's really important. We're dealing with the Shoggoth itself here. So we're, we're shaping, in some sense, its understanding at a more fundamental level of the data. Uh, that's, I think, one of the things that we need. We need the ability to actually shape the pre-training phase itself. Because, you know, I think slapping smiley faces on the beast is not necessarily going to get us there. I don't think there's a smiley face big enough to slap on that beast. Maybe I'm wrong, and I think people should still explore those directions. But that actually did make a difference, at least for my picture of the, the story here, uh, because we are baking these, these this kind of like, there, there's an optimization pressure that comes from the fuzzy words that we want the system to deeply internalize. 
Like the actual optimization objective behaves as if this overall system kind of cares about terms like, you know, truthfulness and honesty and, and benignness. And, and that's interesting to me. Um, I may well be completely wrong. I'm, I'm surely wrong about like most of the shit I'm saying today, but <laughs> this is one way in which uh, at least I'm, I'm definitely more, uh, more optimistic. It's good to hear that you haven't gone full Eliezer Yudkowsky doomerist. I think it's been very interesting to watch. I think he's right on some things. The fact that safety research, anything related to alignment, here I mean alignment more broadly, whether it's the very specific like AI alignment community alignment versus just anything in terms of how do we make these models more safe when we put them into different types of infrastructure. Like if they're generating code, is that code correct? That research really is lagging very far behind capabilities. And I think it's it's broadly right that it feels difficult to say that there's going to be meaningful catch up unless maybe certain ideas people have come up with, like constitutional AI. If you take them farther, then they just turn out to be really, really, really effective. But it's interesting how you can kind of take what we're looking at today and come to some of these radically different conclusions. And so as somebody who is maybe a little bit more plugged into the AI safety community than I am, I'm curious how just in having seen some of these recent comments from Eliezer and some of the heated debate at a minimum that this has sparked, I'm I'm just curious about some of your takeaways and perspectives coming out of all of that. Yeah, I mean, for what they're worth, I uh, so so first off, I, I think it's uh, Eliezer did a great service to the community by raising this issue so long ago. Uh, I think it's um, I'm not sure that he raised it in necessarily the like. I'm I'm honestly not sure, I, and I really mean that. I I don't mean that as a like I'm skeptical of, but like I don't know that writing a bunch of Harry Potter fan fiction uh, was actually the most efficient path to doing what he was trying to do. I actually don't know that it wasn't because the quality of people that are true to the field was extremely high. You talk to alignment researchers, and their understanding of capabilities as well as alignment is like world class. Like these are like they're just really impressive people. Um, and I don't know how much of a function of Eliezer's early work that was. Uh, more recently, his, I'll say his vibe, and I, I don't know a better term to use than vibe. His vibe has, in many cases, not all cases, in many cases, been unhelpful. This is my perception as somebody who talks to um, like folks in the U.S. defense establishment, folks in, in U.S. policy um, at very senior levels, at uh, folks in AI capabilities and alignment, just see like my day is spent socializing and our whole team's day is spent socializing with people in this community. And just the subjectively, the impact this is having on demoralizing people. Um, I'm not talking about like generating false hope here, though I'm sure Eliezer would say that some of my hope is false and, and that's, that's fair. Um, I, if human beings do not do useful things, when they feel completely hopeless. That is a simple fact of human psychology. A fact that even Eliezer himself will acknowledge. I'm sure he has an essay about this. That's the great irony of Eliezer Yudkowsky. He will have entire essays where he writes about how, oh, you don't have permission to put this kind of idea in this person's head because you haven't done X, Y, and Z. And then he proceeds to kind of like commit that very same error uh, in his communication strategy. So I think this is like a, a symptom of somebody who's been at this for a really long time who's been thinking dark thoughts for a really long time, possibly justifiably, uh, but that's made him less effective. I think the Times piece is in, in some ways useful, where he says like, hey, we ought to like consider some fairly radical policy actions. Um, in other ways, it's less useful, and I still don't know where that's going to end up falling. But there's a lot of this kind of like mixed stuff with him where I find it it's not necessarily helpful, especially because, look, we may be approaching something like a... Uh, like a a, uh, well, a tripwire here. I don't know when AGI is going to come. We've got a lot of very clever people telling us that, hey, um, it like it could be fairly soon. If that's the case, we're going to have to make do with what we have. And people are not even going to try if they don't perceive that we have any tools that can make a difference. 
I don't think that we don't have any tools that can make a difference. And even if Eliezer thinks that we probably don't, he can't think that we certainly don't, which means part of his efforts ought to be directed towards at least getting people to try to use the things that might work. I think constitutional AI is one of those things, and I think we should encourage people to consider pushing it further. There are other strategies too. Alex Turner actually had a, another really cool, they're a bit of a tangent, but another really cool strategy uh, where he uh, looked at the activations. So, so he trained a, a model, a, a, I think it was an RL agent, to like navigate a maze and find some cheese. And uh, he was able to move the cheese around in the maze. And, and basically by looking at the activations of his AI system as it looked at these different maze configurations, identify a cheese vector. Basically, if he subtracted that cheese vector from the model's activations, he'd get the model to ignore the cheese. This is a pretty interesting initial taste of not just like diagnosis. A lot of mechanistic interpretation strategies are focused on like, let's diagnose when a model is plotting against us. I think that's actually really important and promising. But this is a treatment. This is a kind of surgery you can perform to kind of lobotomize your AI in a very carefully chosen way to affect its behavior. That's another promising path. And I think we ought to be encouraging, like I think Eliezer has a certain tendency to look at a wide range of different solutions and say, oh, I have already thought of these things and they won't work. I won't tell you how they won't work without writing a 10,000 word essay that people frankly do not have time to read. This is another thing. There's a fundamental issue of respect here for his audience that I think is, I think he's struggling with, with maintaining that respect. And, and that respect is expressed in conciseness. I know this is frustrating because everybody has this feeling like, look, I can't make my point in less than 10,000 words. This is the most complex AI safety related thing, blah, 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 blah. But most people actually do have to make do with that. Most people do have to recognize their audience has a finite attention span and they will just go back to building more powerful systems if you give them a 10,000 word essay to answer a simple question. That I think that's part of the issue here. Well, I guess on, on everything you said, yeah, it does seem like the discourse he has can be unhelpful. To ride the tangent a little bit on the cheese vector, because I think this is actually pretty important here that does speak to notions of controllability. And as you said, ways we could align things. There's been similar research recently that has really excited me. I saw one paper, I want to say a couple of months back on task vectors. And literally the idea, the code for the idea was very simple. You want a model that you want it to be maybe less capable at some particular task. So you've got access to the pre-trained model weights, you've got access to the fine-tuned model weights for maybe different tasks. And you can literally just like subtract pre-trained model weights from fine-tuned model weights or between different fine-tuned models. And you end up with a model that is predictably more or less capable in some of the areas that you might want it to be. And the fact that ideas like this seem to work, if they can be composed and they can be kind of taken further, that does seem to present something really promising for if you want to do, you know, selective lobotomy on a system, then it does seem like there's some really exciting research directions that are allowing for things we can do here. I, I very much agree, actually, to your point on composability. That was one of the themes of the cheese vector too. Um, they were able to identify a couple of different things besides the cheese vector and mix and match. Of course, it remains to be seen how well this will work with language models. And that was the, one of the big points that was made in the paper. Um, I think Alex was even kind of taking bets on what the outcomes would be. And I really hope that these things generalize. If they do, um, and in some sense, even if they don't, strategies like this are kind of proliferating and being experimented with. They're also dead simple. Like this is something that I find appealing about them. Like the, the idea of a cheese vector, the idea of a task vector, these are like like all okay it's easy to say in hindsight they're like the first thing you should have thought of i didn't know them so who the hell am i to say this but like you know they could have been it's just like hey subtract out like see if you can find a vector for this subtract it out from the activations like this this, this is like unreasonably effective in the same way that neural networks are unreasonably effective and there, a lot of these strategies have as well scaling properties that I think are quite desirable. Constitutional AI has this like AI on AI feedback loop that scales implicitly. Uh, if you can identify, you know, 
things like cheese vectors or task vectors that has, you know, good scaling properties as well. So I think, you know, it's, we ought to prepare ourselves for a world in which we may have a bag of tricks that could be just sufficient enough to get us to a point where AIs can help with alignment research. This is a point I really should add too. Sorry, another tangent here, but so OpenAI and Anthropic, I think mostly OpenAI here, um, has a philosophy uh, quite famously that they want to eventually use AI to align AI. Right? The, the, so Jan Leica, the head of alignment at OpenAI, doesn't necessarily think we're going to find a one-shot kill solution for the alignment problem. Um, which, by the way, aesthetically, that seems to be very much where Eliezer Yudkowsky wants to go. He wants that certainty of a one-shot kill, like something that is theoretically robust, provably safe and all that. I don't think we're going to get that. I think Eliezer doesn't think he's going to get that, and, and uh, Jan Leica doesn't either. So Jan is focused on like how can we get AI to help with alignment research. Um, I think it's possible that we can get there, and I think that when Eliezer says an AI that can do alignment research is very likely to also be catastrophically dangerous already, um, I'm actually I think there's room for skepticism there. We've seen Eliezer be wrong about a lot of stuff, including, I believe, like, I don't think we were really supposed to live in a world where language models could code up full apps uh, from a simple uh, plain English language prompt without being dead. Like, I think that, I, I, and now I may be screwing this up, there may be a 10,000 word essay where there's like a three paragraph section where it's alluded, it's alluded to that this is not like a thing and that he's hedging, hedging, hedging. But at the very least, uh, the, your world model should include the possibility that we get to that point. And, and the way things are shaping up, maybe it should start to depend on that because that might be one of our better plays. And strategies like constitutional AI, strategies like looking at, you know, what can we do with mechanistic interpretability and task vectors and so on, stacking these together might allow us to get to that point and, you know, come up with an engineering-like solution to this problem rather than one that would appeal to a physicist, which is, I think, the mindset Eliezer is bringing to this. He wants an equation. He wants something verifiable, certain, and confident. As a guy who's had to move from physics thinking to engineering thinking through most of his life, uh, I think that, you know, I think we're going to have to switch poles on this one, not because I want to. I would love the equation. I would love that. I, I think we should keep searching for it. I'm not optimistic about it, um, but that doesn't mean I'm completely pessimistic about our, our our outcomes here. I think there are important differences here. So I don't know how much this inference holds up, but it's notable when we think about the idea that certain people would like something that is provable, justifiable. When we try to do theory work on deep neural networks, a lot of classical machine learning theory tends to break apart. And I think we're still not at a place where we have some unified, agreed upon, this is how everything works. And we feel like we have a full mathematical understanding here. And I'm aware, I guess, that some results in alignment are like, okay, this is a black box. We can just abstract away. But it still feels really difficult to say, okay, we can have something that is fully provable about these neural networks and their behavior when it comes to some alignment results we might want. When I'm just analyzing the behavior of a neural network on its own, not considering alignment, that's something we still don't totally have a handle on. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, I think that's for a, a really fundamental. So, you know, in philosophy, people often talk about like the is ought uh, dichotomy and, and how you can't get an ought from an is. You can stack up all the facts you want about how nature works. You're never going to get facts about morality out of that. And I think this is similar, right? There, there, there's essentially, we've got two categories of things. We've got like alignment, which in a sense is kind of like our ought. It's the behavior we want to see manifested by these systems. And then we've got the fact of the, the is, which is like the weights and parameter values in these neural networks and like just the, the encodings that we feed them and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so the, these two things live in separate universes and they're connected by embeddings, but the embeddings are generated by the is. And that's and they're not perfectly connected because those embeddings it's quite possible will try to fuck us up like though that's where the dangerous thinking might come in and that's what we're trying to control and so the, the sort of blood brain barrier between those two things is i think that like one of the fundamental reasons why there's a challenge with mechanistic interpretability um generally speaking what you see people trying to do is like feed a model an input and like see how that input the the, the meaning that you externally ascribe to that input gets represented in the, the weights of the model. 
And if you know you feed it what you think is a car and it lights up in certain ways, you go, oh, those are the ways associated with car. But you're the one who made that leap in the first place of saying that the thing you fed it was a car. Maybe the model instead said, no, I think the road is the most important part or the, you know, some other part of the image that you're not quite in that sense, you know, I don't know, feels philosophically related to inner alignment where like you think you're telling it one thing, but it, anyway, it's not quite. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's very true. I want to maybe segue a little bit from this discussion about risks and different mitigation strategies to how that's manifested in your work on policy. So as part of Gladstone, I know that you think a lot about policy. You were mentioning earlier that you spend quite a bit of time socializing with people in government. And this is a pretty interesting time because as we're talking, there have been some pretty recent advancements, I think, in the EU AI Act. The Biden-Harris administration just put out a fact sheet relating to some recent actions they've taken. And so I'm curious for you in the work you've been doing, how all of this thinking manifests in the conversations you're having with policymakers and perhaps some of the read you have on how particularly, I suppose, American policymakers are thinking about some of these questions. Yeah. Um, so I, I won't dive too much into individual policies because our role is largely that of a facilitator rather than a like a policy generation or specific advocacy group. So what we want to do is try to get coherence around the big groups working on this stuff to find common ground and make sure that they can all figure out like, okay, it's in our interest to do X, to you know establish these shared safety standards, to only scale in this way and under these circumstances, and to share information about risk in this way. Um, so, so that's kind of like just at a, at a meta level. Um, but more specifically, yeah. So I will say one of the biggest take-homes for, for me, and I think for our whole team, um, for a long time, in the world of Eliezer Yudkowsky, the world of effective altruism, the word on the street was don't talk to government. Why? Um, well, essentially, uh, government is going to misunderstand what you're saying about AI risk. They're going to hear uh, about the capabilities. They're, they're going to go, oh my God, like AI could be really powerful. We'd better build that, but they're not going to hear you out on the risks. They're just going to lurch ahead. So this is exactly the kind of perspective that I think people come up with when they are in a high compute, low data environment. They're sitting there, so, so they have a, a perfectly self-justified reason not to collect data about whether that hypothesis is even true. They're not, because th their whole worldview is I'm not going to engage with government, so therefore I'm not gonna learn how government actually plays with these ideas and whether they are dangerous in this way. And I'm gonna just spend all my time thinking, theorizing about what might actually happen if this were to occur. Uh, this leads to badly broken mental models of how government actually works, what government people think, and what might happen under different circumstances. That's my opinion, but it's also, I think by now, my experience. We've spent the last two years very carefully working our way up, let's say, the risk ladder in our engagements with government, you know, going deeper and deeper into you know, long-term AI risk and that sort of thing. And what we found to a, to a T is people are extremely receptive to the arguments around risk. I think that's been reflected, by the way, in the shift in the public narrative that we've seen around AI risk. We were always told in the effective altruism community, or the effective altruism community is always messaging this, that uh, we should we ought not talk to the public about these risks because they're not going to be able to handle it. They're going to panic. Th things are going to become polarized. Maybe they will become polarized. But at least right now, it very much seems like people are hearing Jeff Hinton come out with his messaging. People on the right are hearing Elon Musk come out with his messaging about risk. Um, you know, like overall on the basic question of is there risk here, even risk that would have sounded like science fiction to people just like five years ago, I think people have shown themselves much more um, able to understand and grapple with these ideas. And that's only given us more ability to come up with sound, rational policies. Like it has moved the Overton window in a way that um, a bunch of like people uh, kind of huddling up together and, and agreeing on complex theories of how they're going to pull off whatever a convoluted scheme to, to create safe policies on their own just could not. We need the public to be bought into this stuff. And I think that's actually happening. And, and it's happening on a significant delay relative to when it could have, partly, I do believe, because of some of the approaches here, where the strategy was just non-engagement rather than treating engagement as a product problem. Like, iterate on your messaging, see how it lands, try again. 
you're not going to talk to one person in government and find that they're going to go off and, and do something crazy. You just don't get buy-in in government like that. There is too much systemic friction for that to happen. And so you actually get a lot of shots at bat. Like you get to, to try messaging, see how it fails in real time, iterate and go again. And that's been the story of our success, I think, at this point in terms of raising awareness at, at some pretty high levels about AI risk in a way that you know, if a lot of these same people saw it, like this is what's making it possible for us to push forward the policies that now at the 11th hour, a lot of these very groups are all of a sudden saying we need yesterday. That's a really important way to think about it. I guess when it comes to actually doing policy, not that I'm a policymaker or somebody who spent any time on this, but to what you said about iterating on messaging and trying things out again and again and again until you get it right, that does seem to be the way that I hear many policies and convincing people about things tends to work in the policy world. And so it's just natural that when you are concerned about certain things related to AI, that you just kind of have to adapt to the same strategy. And perhaps the whole non-engagement strategy up till now maybe ended up with a, you know, you have to have a one shot kill solution to this as well. You either convince them or you don't convince them. And if you don't convince them, well, oh God, you know, we're, we're screwed. We can't engage again. We're never going to get anybody on our side. But to what you're saying, and I guess as your experience reflects, you can convince people over time in this incremental manner. And you can refine the product itself, right? The messaging itself. Exactly. That makes it easier next time. Yeah. Look, I think a lot of the the challenge here, you know, when you think like a physicist, you tend to skip to the long-term equilibrium state and go like, okay, it, you know, this thing is going to go from zero to foom. Like, cause that's, that's the two equations that I can write out. I can write out how it is now. And then I can write out how it is when I pump a bunch of infinities in my, in my coefficients, right? Like th th that's the two ways of thinking because they, they're beautiful. They're simple, but there's a messy transient in between. And all the leverage is hidden in that transient. That's true for policy. So that messy time between, like that's where you got to get your hands dirty and try to affect outcomes. And it's also, I suspect, possibly true for safety. This is where we get into the question of like, yeah, but what happens between uh, zero and foom? Like, like what, how could we play with things? Could we get AI that's not foomy, but like very, very smart to uh, to help us align that next system. Could we get some of these strategies, and, and arguably constitutional AI is a version of that, right? Like we have a, an AI that's helping us align another AI that would, in a way that was not supposed to happen. Again, we have an AI system that understands in some sense, fuzzy words like trustworthiness and, and, and transparency and benignness. And then we're using that understanding to help us kind of affect the, the, the effective uh, optimization objective of the first model. So yeah, I think that the trans reasoning through the the non equilibrium phase is maybe kind of from an aesthetic standpoint. I think I see that as as part of what's missing, but I I do want to flag as much as it sounds like I'm ripping on on effective altruists and, and all this stuff. Um, I I think they're phenomenal people in this ecosystem. I think they they make excellent points, and I do think we ought to proceed with caution and and like keep asking ourselves. You know, what is what is their argument here? Keep engaging with people who disagree with us on the how, uh, but not necessarily on the what. Like we're very much aligned on the what, but but having that discussion, like we're always gonna gonna miss out if we get locked into our own perspective on this stuff. And so um, I, I think they've been a great ecosystem. It's a great community. I think it needs to be at the table. That's a big part of our job is to make sure that exactly that community is well represented here. Like we may have, you know, differences of opinion on how to do stuff, but if we ever create room for a meaningful conversation that can drive outcomes, yeah, we want people from that community there. They were, in our view, they've been right so long about so many of these things that we'd be insane not to. And so um, anyway, I, I, I just want to make sure that I, I get put that out there because otherwise it might sound like I'm being <laughs> very anti-EA, which is, is very much not the case. Sure. When it comes to some of these conversations and getting people more and more on board, one thing I've observed recently that I would imagine also contributes to this is in recent months, I think there's been more and more commentary among people with very large audiences about some of the individual advances in AI and how it feels like in the span of a week, we're now seeing 
the type of development we would have seen over months or maybe years, just a decade ago. And you hear people talking about AutoGPT, about the recent generative simulacra paper, and just kind of saying, okay, what does what does this augur for the future? And so I'm curious if that too kind of comes into some of this strategic component when it comes to convincing policymakers to care about this? Do you find people paying attention when it comes to like government officials to some of these developments? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, what it has done is it's given us a hell of a lot more uh, to point to, uh, you know, more, more leverage in terms of both capabilities and risks. And it's also started to kind of muddy the water between like, our, our theory has always been that, you know, we go through a phase where malicious use is the biggest risk class until all of a sudden accident risk becomes the biggest risk class. Somewhere in between or maybe all along adversarial risk is also a really big factor as people try to push these uh, AIs actively kind of out of their training distribution to display potentially very catastrophic outcomes. Um, but I'll tell you one of the things that was very telling was, you know, when auto GPT first became a thing, and uh, and some schmuck decided to create chaos GPT. Give auto GPT the goal of destroying the world. Hey, why not? Now the, the update for me here was like, whoa, whoa, like malicious use, accident risk, whatever. We have human beings who, when given a button that says, hey, you know, like uh, get, <laughs> see how you can use this to do bad shit, they'll just they'll fucking you know push the button. And and that's in in a sense that's very useful because it means we ought to be under no illusions that the full range of capabilities exhibited by powerful systems will be leveraged in dangerous ways, whether the intent is there or not. And in some, again, that's simplifying. It, it, it's helpful because it allows you to just focus on, okay, the capabilities. We don't want these systems to really be hackable in any way to produce these sorts of outputs, certainly if they're going to be made available to the public. And I think that's another important dimension is the open source stuff. I love open source. I think open source has been one of the most wonderful things for a number of different reasons, um, not just because it, it helps democratize the tech, gives more people access and so on, but also because AI safety researchers can get access to larger models and play around with them. Um, you know, RLHF, um, open source packages are coming out, frameworks and stuff. So it, it is really helpful, um, but I think we're going to have to start thinking deeply about uh, whether it's a good thing for open source to be open source as these models get more capable. Here is an argument that I simply cannot imagine a counter argument to. As AIs get more powerful, the destructive footprint of malicious actors that use them is simply going to grow and grow and grow. As open source AI gets more powerful, the destructive footprint of malicious actors that use open source AI is going to grow and grow and grow. At some point, I don't particularly care what that threshold is, but at some point, even the most diehard open source advocate has to concede that we are going to have to turn around this entire battleship. So we ought to be thinking about that now because we have open source systems that are already capable of helping out with spam, with malware generation, all this shit. Like, and we know how fast AI moves. I don't think there's a credible, credible argument that says that we shouldn't be thinking of open source, like of, of ways to... Um, mitigate risks associated with open source slash restrict access to open source in different ways. I, I just don't see how you can like even make that argument given the trajectory we've seen the tech on. Um, I, I'm sure that I, I should walk that back. That's a stupid thing to say. There, there, of course, are possibly going to be arguments, but I guess my point is this is the world as I see it. This is a pretty compelling default course to me. And I'd be really curious to hear if there's a, uh, if there's a real counter argument to that position. Um, yeah. So open source is something I, I do find concerning in the long run. I'm in the same boat with you. There definitely is a camp out there who seem to think that everything needs to be open source everywhere. And I'm certainly not a part of that. And I think that there are, of course, gradations of this view. So I don't think it's worth straw manning and painting everybody who likes open source as of that point. But I do think you're right that a lot of work needs to be done on, yes, how do we lock down these systems? Because even when you adopt a partial release strategy, as how things turned out with Llama, for example, indicated, you you can't really keep things locked down in the way you might want to. And when it comes to even not malicious use, but to what you were saying about Chaos GPT, that seems like something that if the system 
has access to any sort of critical infrastructure that could plausibly be used for something nefarious or just turn out not so great, that that seems like something you really want to restrict and lock down. Yeah, and and I think so. The most to be clear, like there is one argument that I do buy on the open source uh, limitation thing, and I I just kind of feel like there has to be a way to thread this needle. Um, is, and, and that has to do with catastrophic risk, right? The, the, there's a whole um, sort of like world of independent AI alignment researchers out there who do need access to cutting edge, highly scaled models so that they can, you know, test mechanistic interpretability strategies so they can learn things like where is the cheese vector in these scaled systems. Um, but I think that the, that is a, a well enough defined use case. And a lot of these individuals are, uh, let's say, I readily identifiable enough that maybe you could have your cake and eat it too here, or at least experiment with that. But I think that this default of like, let's open it up to the to the wider world. Um, I yeah, I think you start to run into some problems pretty quickly. Yeah, it does seem like some kind of balance there is needed, and I definitely agree with you that not full open source, but allowing people who need to do that kind of research to do it is something really valuable. Before we finish up, I do want to make sure that we have a chance to talk about your book. So you recently published Quantum Mechanics Made Me Do It, drawing on some of your experience as a physicist. I'd love for you to introduce the book. Yeah, for, happy to do it. it. So it is called Quantum Physics Made Me Do It, though I've made that mistake of calling it Quantum Mechanics Made Me Do It so many times myself. Like, don't even worry. Like, my mom will text me. She'll be like, oh, I just saw a copy of Quantum Mechanics Made Me Do It. I don't know why. Anyway, um, but yeah. So Thanks for is, correcting me. <laughs> no, no worries. No, I, I appreciate the plug. Um, so it actually is, in a sense, related to what we're, we're talking about here, because you can work your way back from... Um, you know, the, uh, sorry, Ilya Sutskever's famous tweet about today's AIs being maybe slightly conscious to questions around like, well, you know, are they slightly conscious and how would we know? And that immediately ropes in the physics of consciousness. And it's not like this book is meant to give you an answer, right? Like we don't know. Surprise, surprise. There is no actual like basis that we have on which to determine what's conscious and what's not, which by the way, I think is its own kind of ethical question when it comes to AI. Like I... I agree that I like I don't think current AI systems are conscious. Uh, but like, if you asked me, okay, buddy, then when would you say that they're? Because at some point, if you if you don't think there's something magical going on in the human brain, at some point we're going to replicate the richness of human information processing in an artificial substrate. Like that's going to happen. So when, buddy? When's that going to be? And my answer is. I have no idea. And if you'd asked me this question like five years ago, I might have given you an answer that sounded something like today's technology. And so I think there's this like bias that we all have because we know the exact the exact mathematical structure of the neurons in our networks and, and the attention mechanisms and all this stuff. We're biased to think of them as kind of like just cars with fancy engines. And the brain is this sort of like happened the other way around. We were just handed this like magical structure and we kind of went, like, oh, wow, it has all these special abilities before we knew how it worked. Maybe someday when we know how the brain works in such intricate detail that it feels to us more like the neural networks do, uh, we'll, we'll start to think of ourselves as being less important or as conscious as being less important or less real. I don't know. But the bottom line is that um, somehow the physics of consciousness is going to be a relevant ingredient in this, if only so that we can write off the, the fact that it's important and, and focus more on the information processing element. Um, so this book is, among other things, about all the different interpretations of quantum mechanics that exist, all the different ways right, of thinking about these simple equations that seem to describe and predict the world very well, um, but that don't give us a picture of what's actually going on. People have to read in the interpretation of what particles, what objects, what structures actually exist out there in the universe. And so this is like a super, super layperson friendly thing. It's it's meant to be like, you have no, even no math back. Like there's zero really. Like we've had high school students read it, that sort of thing. And uh, and yeah, it tees up these kind of longer term questions about AI as well uh, towards the end. So I have begun reading it myself and I can oh, vouch that it is a very enjoyable read. Yes, I, I had to read the physics of consciousness section just because that was too interesting, but I'm reading it from the beginning now. And I do love the the kind of conversational way that you write about all this. To give people a bit of a sneak peek, 
Do you want to perhaps rehearse a couple of the different theories of consciousness we could have and some of the physics, some of the interpretation that kind of backs those? Yeah, for, I'm happy to. I, I'm so, so glad that you you checked out the book. I'm 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 honored. Thank you. <laughs> maybe maybe the the place to start here is. Uh, and, and by the way, as I do this, there are going to be physicists listening to this who kind of go like, "Oh, but you're not giving the full whatever." So that's kind of the point of this book is it's like uh, the the condensed and abridged version. But um, I'll I'll give you the kind of uh, the the short version then. So essentially, uh, there are only two weird things about quantum mechanics. Um. So the first weird thing is that particles, like electrons, can do many different mutually exclusive things at the same time. So an electron can spin clockwise and it can spin counterclockwise at the same time. Right? If you think about it in terms of colors, what I'm saying is if clockwise spinning electron is white and counterclockwise spinning electron is black, then an electron can actually be a shade of gray. And don't try to picture it. It's impossible to picture. The human brain breaks. This is way out of distribution for our tiny little brains. Um, that's one weird thing. Uh, the other weird thing is that when a another physical system interacts with one of these gray electrons or gray particles, one of these particles is doing many different things at the same time, then that new thing gets split into as many different versions of the particle as existed. So if the electron is spinning clockwise and counterclockwise at the same time, and you put a detector next to it that's meant to detect its spin direction, the detector will get split. One version of it will see the electron spinning clockwise, and it'll go click, the electron was spinning clockwise. And the other will see the electron spinning counterclockwise, and it will go click, the electron is spinning counterclockwise. Um, so now if you, the classic Schrodinger's cat thing, you know, you, you put this electron, it's spinning in two directions at the same, at the same time in a box, Next to the electron, you put this detector, and then the detector is hooked up to a gun that's pointing at a cat. If the electron is spinning clockwise, the detector clicks, the gun goes off, the cat dies. If the electron is spinning counterclockwise, the detector doesn't go click, the gun doesn't go off, and the cat lives. And now the question is, what's going to happen inside this box if the electron is spinning in both directions at the same time? Now, the answer is, first, the detector gets split into two versions of itself. One sees the, the clockwise spin and clicks, the other sees the counterclockwise spin and doesn't. And in turn, the gun will get split. One version of it sees the detector that clicked and goes off and kills the cat, and then the other doesn't, and the cat lives. So now you have this box that contains two parallel timelines, essentially. And the question is, what happens when we open the box? And for a long time, the view that dominated was something like, um, well, I've never seen a half-dead, half-alive cat. I've never seen two kind of box, uh, two boxes with two different contents existing at the same time. So there must be something about the act of observing the system that, I don't know, magically forces nature, I guess, to choose one of these outcomes to become real. And that was the view that uh, Niels Bohr had. He was the kind of key pioneer, one of the key pioneers of quantum mechanics. He called this collapse. So you open the box and just magically by looking at it, nature goes, uh, shit, we got to pick one. And then boom, it picks cat alive, cat dead. And that's the end of the story. Um, but then a guy called Hugh Everett the third came along and said, well, wait a minute. Shouldn't the same rules that apply to the gun, the detector, and the cat also apply to you as a human being? Shouldn't you also get split when you interact with this system? One version of you sees a live cat. Another version of you sees a dead cat. And if you ask either of those versions, how many experimental outcomes did you see? They would say, uh, obviously just one. Then, you know, that kind of explains the situation. And so this is a view that gives rise to, you know, many, many parallel universes. Um, so it, on the first view, if you take Niels Bohr, you say the idea is I look at a box like this and I magically collapse it. Then the question becomes how, what is it about you that causes the system to collapse? In fact, it, like, is it your consciousness? And if so, like, could the cat have done that? Like, is the cat conscious enough for quantum purposes? In fact, is the gun conscious enough for quantum purposes? How far down the chain do we go until we get, you know, to the the conscious, the first conscious entity, the the quantum cut, as uh, John von Neumann, famous uh, computer scientist, among other things, uh, coined the phrase. 
And so anyway, there's this, I, this question of like, where does this magic collapse power come from? Is it tied to consciousness? If so, what does that tell us about the nature of consciousness? I don't buy that view at all personally, but one of the things that I really try to do in the book is give every perspective a fair shake. And I'm trying to try to be very clear about you know my own biases, partly because I think it makes us better people to just be like, hey, like this is what I think, and I'm probably wrong in these various ways. Um, so anyway, bit of a ramble, but that's kind of the, the pitch there. That's a really wonderful way to present a set of views. If you're listening to this, if you find any of this interesting, I do hope you'll go check out Jeremy's book. Jeremy, I think this is a great place to end. Thank you for the conversation today. It was really interesting hearing the set of perspectives you have on a lot of these issues from AI safety to policy to, to quantum consciousness. I appreciate your taking the time to talk to me today. My pleasure, Daniel. Thanks for the, the fun chat. And that is a wrap, my friends. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, you can subscribe to The Gradient on Substack to receive not just this podcast, but also our articles and newsletters directly to your email. You can also visit us at thegradient.pub, where you'll find all of that, as well as more information about The Gradient and how you could even contribute if you're interested. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate your feedback. If you'd like to leave a comment or review, we'd love to know how we can make this series more interesting and informative to you. And with all that, I'll leave you until the next episode.